Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here today chairing this table that will talk about the changes in the Brazilian fiscal policy for international treaties against double taxation. Before addressing the subject at issue at this table, I would like to thank the coordination of IBDT for the invitation. It's a huge joy to be back at this house where I studied. My first contact with international taxation was here. So thank you for the invitation. Just to put within context the debate we're holding now, Brazil has executed the first international treaty to avoid double taxation by the end of the 60s. Obviously, within a different economic tech context compared to today, back then it was used at the, B convention, the convention of OECD and its wording at that time, with some important question marks important to be affected principle of the paying sources to protecting and maximizing Brazil's law to tax income made here by those who lived abroad. Many things from that time to now, especially the internationalization of the economy as we saw in the previous panel and the digitalization of the economy, and this obviously remain or became clear the fact that treaties that we had based on those those wordings of the 60s and old, they do not face the challenges that were posed by the new reality. And obviously, the England revenue of Brazil is not and uh, never has been um, disregarding this. And we saw throughout the years an attempt, a movement towards the executive branch with the inland revenue in order to adapt the text of international treaties. So if we look international treaties that are rec recently Brazil is signatories and those of the 60s, we will see some important changes. I believe the main ones that we can notice clearly is the see during the 90s, the introduction of clauses anti-abuse clauses that effective beneficiary and benefits limitation to and the information we see an importance regarding international cooperation and we start talking about international treaties not only as a mechanism to avoid double taxation but also not to allow double non taxation which is to guarantee that somewhere the tax pay taxpayer will pay his or his share of taxes and we can address and debate this share. But it's an effective change in this sense also to guarantee that the Brazilian state can, in some cases, apply its own legislation anti-abuse and not be prevented by international treaties. So we see some clauses of recent treaties with this purpose. This is the backdrop that we will have now at this table. We count with a table which is highly qualified to address the subject. Professor Torre, Julia, Ramon Tomazella, and Cameron and Ricardo. Oh, Professor, now I pass the floor to Julia that we'll have this stack of organizing our speed, uh, talk and moderate uh, our debate on the subject. Thank you very much. Thank you, Priscilla. Good afternoon. I, I would like to thank all like Priscilla. Before starting, I would like to stress that we have a QR code for posing questions. So in the next panel, we can address better some doubts that you might have due to the lack of time for addressing all. So we start with our guest, Eric Cameron, that will share with us the outlook of Holland and perhaps Europe as a whole, according to the emerging countries taxation agreements and the practical side of things that she could have 11 of these agreements. So professor, you have the floor. Is it working? Yeah, okay, great. Well, uh, thank you very much, Louis, and the entire team for inviting me again. And 
I was here, I think, the first time in 2018. Well, 2020, we all know COVID prohibited us to come over, and I'm so happy that uh, you are still uh, allowing me to contribute to this uh, wonderful Congress, and I want to congratulate you and the entire team already with a fantastic organization. Wonderful, absolutely fabulous. Um, what will I try to discuss with you in the time allowed with, uh, for me? Well, the tax treaties with emerging countries like Brazil. That is the approach, and from a Dutch perspective, and a bit of a European perspective, because there's not much. But we will see. Um, see whether it works. Yeah, what is the agenda? I try to get through some history with you, a Dutch tax treaty policy during, let's say, 40 years. Where came we from? Where are we now? There, Europe will also be um, involved, especially in respect of the UN, fr UN Framework Convention. There you see that there is a EU approach. Is that a very promising approach? Maybe not. Um, next to that, I was also asked to discuss a current issue under the Brazilian Dutch Tax Treaty. And we have an issue here on the classification of interest on net equity. And I will address that, and I will be very transparent. I'm also an EY, uh, an off counsel with EY, and I am in one of the litigation teams that is litigating and has won in the court of first instance, but the tax situation has appealed, so we have to go on. Uh, we will discuss uh, the issues. Um, you could say, yeah, you're biased then. That could be true. But on the other hand, I'm an academic, and for me as an academic, it's very important that I'm an independent academic. So I write all kinds of things which are not in the interest of EY clients. Has never been a problem. This is not a problem either in this case. Now it coincides also with my academic views on it. So there's no difference. Well, and then also a question was, hey, what are the challenges? What are opportunities? And I will be a bit provocative in this house. I will challenge you in this way, do not implement Article 12b. But rethink of the interest allocation rules in respect of interest. And that comes partly very close to what Joao has advocated. What is source for me? What is the origin of the interest income? And shouldn't that be leading in order to organize a legitimate claim? on taxation of interest. Well, and I hope I can do all of that in 25 minutes. <laughs> so please help me. Um, main conclusions at the end, promise. Well, a historical overview. Where did it start? Well, first the policy was published in 1987. And I'm focusing on the relationship with developing countries. Was it addressed in that time? Yes. But what was the approach? The OECD approach was leading. Oh yeah, and to a certain extent, we take into account also the UN model. To a certain extent. So it did not play a very uh, important role. But on the other hand, and that is also relevant again for um, the uh, interest on net equity, the Netherlands is sympathetic in respect of tax and credits for developing countries. And that is the big issue for the uh, interest on net equity, whether you are in the Netherlands entitled to a 25% tax parent credit or a 20%. And that makes a huge difference, of course, in your return of investments. So you may wonder, and I <laughs> already uh, say it here, what is the map of 2022 where the agreement is that it should be classified as interest and not as dividend under the treaty, what is the interest of Brazil in that context? I understand the interest of the Netherlands, uh, because you have to provide less tax parent credit than uh, the 20% instead of the 25%. Well, if you look at 1996, that was a subsequent document on uh, the tax treaty policy, well, you see that it is not moving much, but there is much a bit more involvement 
in this way that the Netherlands also participates in the ad hoc expert group. But there's more done at the personal uh, title and we are still in there. Um, it starts a bit flowing, you could say, in 1998. There is more attention to the situation of the developing states. In this way, that also the attitude differs. Instead of monitoring whether there is a coherency between uh, the UN model and the OECD model, there's more approach for what are the specific problems of developing states and to talk with them, to include them. You could say maybe it was a start bit of thinking as an inclusive framework, if it's at all inclusive nowadays. Um, on the other hand, it also says, well, actually the UN model becomes less and less relevant. Why? Well, we have now positions also of non-OCD countries in the OCD model. So actually it says, well, the OCD model becomes even more important, which seems not to be very helpful in that approach if you take it very seriously, the position of developing countries. On the other hand, you see also that uh, some elements of the UN model are taken into account. For instance, building sites uh, instead of the 12 month period under the OECD model, uh, a six month period is already sufficient. A no-go area, and that is for a lot of developing countries uh, maybe problematic, is a force of attraction. So. Uh, the activities are not attributable to a PE, but nevertheless, profits are allocated to the PE. Well, that is not acceptable. Uh, the Netherlands said, well, if there are some uh, things to be proven, we will discuss those rules, how to prove it, but not that you can allocate profits which are not connected, not instrumental to the business of a PE. Interest, and this you see here, that's the typical position of a capital exporting country. We want to get it all. Not a bit for what's called the source country, the paying country. No, we want it all. Like the US, export neutrality. And this is, I think, also a, one of the big issues in the relationship between OECD countries like the Netherlands and developing countries. The Netherlands is a capital exporting country, whereas developing countries are capital importing countries. And if you say the interest is all mine, that doesn't help the growth of developing countries, the economic growth. And later on, I will advocate that we should change that rule and that that is beneficial for bene uh, developing countries. Royalties. It says, well, that should be allocated not to the state where the IP is used. No, that should be for industrial reward, for instance, where it has been developed. Also in order to avoid excess tax credit positions. And for me, that's a relevant element in this way. Where has that IP been produced? Is that where it is used or where the research and development was done? And I will uphold the latter one. If you produce a machine and rent it out, I have never heard that that rent should be taxed in the state where the entrepreneur is using the machine. And that it should be taxed over there in that country. From an economic perspective, it doesn't matter whether it's a tangible property or an intangible property. You just use property, assets, in order to produce new income in that entrepreneur, uh, in that enterprise. So I have a lot of sympathy for that element. Well, in 2011, we see that the Netherlands is getting more and more aware of the specific position of the uh, developing countries. What do you see? We want to have more tax treaties, the government said, with developing states. Um, why? Well, it will contribute to the economic growth of those states, but also 
to self-reliance, that they can build their own economy and finance their own public goods or services in that respect. Uh, but on the other hand, also the legitimacy of those governments should be strengthened as such, not only in the tax position, but in general. And there's also a self-interest in this way that it provides legal certainty for that enterprises and civilians, which is also relevant, of course, for investments. You want to be sure what is the tax costs when you invest. Um, and also, we see here that the, uh, 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 the capacity building is already getting in uh, to improve the tax systems of the countries, but also to improve the strength of the tax administrations, that there is sufficient expertise uh, in this way. So domestic resource mobilization in that respect was already there in 2011 as well. So that's not something that was invented only recently. Um, the Netherlands is getting much more involved in the informal task, on, uh, force, task force on tax and development. And then also, which is connected with the strengthening of the legitimacy of the government, an integer and a fascist tax administration is a requirement from the Dutch perspective as the government. Also, strengthening tax compliance, so try to mitigate tax evasion and that kind of things. Yeah, that's also relevant. The revenue should come in. Yeah? It's not only handing out an assessment, but also getting the money in. That's, of course, very relevant. Transparency and the exchange of information. That's also relevant, yeah? that you cooperate with each other. Um, you see also that they are that the Dutch position is slightly moving to much uh, to more UN model, you could say. So the definition of permanent resettlement, it can be a deviation, but only by exception. Uh, if it's necessary to have a final go, that uh, to come to the treaty itself. Before 2011, it was a no-go area. Uh, international shipping and air transport. Also there, you see that a limited source state taxation is allowed. Oh, sorry. And source taxes. The Netherlands is prepared to. Oh, sorry. Is prepared uh, to accept higher source state tax rates, source, uh, source taxations than in other situations in respect of developing countries. But it, war it gives also a warning. Higher source, ta source taxes may create an additional burden, lower return on investment and can affect and indeed the level of investment, foreign investment in your country. So that should be taken into account. Well, the most recent document that we have is of 2020. Um, and you see there, there is even more attention for the developing countries. The sustainable development goals are leading. That's what the government tells us at least. You may wonder whether it's always true, but that's the ambition. What do we see? The Netherlands thinks that the development in its tax treaty policy is beneficial for uh, developing countries. The economic relationships between the Netherlands and developing countries will be improved. So there will be more investments from the Netherlands into developing countries because of the tax treaty policy, the, go the government says. What should we do? Well, double taxation is killing, as we know. So that should be removed, but also tax avoidance and unintended, unintended use of tax fees and tax evasion. Yeah, that's, that's a re really relevant. Unintended use, which is different from tax avoidance. Nowadays, they mix it up. Uh, I, I, how should I put that politely? Uh, very frequently. <laughs> uh, and also aggressive tax planning. What is aggressive? Uh, tax planning and tax avoidance are sometimes also put on one pile. Well, they are different elements. Administrative uh, cooperation, so effective dispute resolutions should be in place and also exchange of information. And then again, and that's really, uh, they really try to make an effort in that, strengthening the capacity of the administrations, the tax administrations, by bilateral and multilateral programs. And Joao, you are as IBFD also participating in those bilateral programs uh, financed by the Dutch government, isn't it? So uh, expertise is made available in that respect. Sorry, Joao. 
this year not, but uh, as, a, uh, as a policy it is. Yeah. Um, what you also see is here that the service permanent establishment is nowadays acceptable for the Netherlands. And I think that is a big step forward where you do not need tangible assets for a PE, which is completely out of date. People create income. Tangible assets and offers not. So that's what the focus should be, I think. And that is a good development, I think, for developing countries indeed. Um, international shipping and air transport. Well, it's a bit ambiguous what the, the, the government says. Is it only shipping income or shipping and air income? But uh, uh, by exception, it's willing to accept Article 8B, but then at a low rate. Dividend, interest and royalties, again, it emphasizes to accept higher source taxes in that respect, but also taking into account what the comp competitive position of the Netherlands is. What has been included in treaties with other Western countries. And also it opens up the door if countries, developing countries, want to change their policy and introduce higher withholding taxes, and they can prove that there's a new policy, it will be taken into account as well. So it's not that stubborn anymore. Um, and also it understands that uh, gross taxation is easier to administer for tax administration in developing countries than net income. So that's also an element in that respect. Technical services, also an issue that was addressed already today. And I think the position is right in this way that source state taxation should be allowed but only if the services are carried out in that state. And here the restriction is to the poorest developing countries. I would say this should be the general approach. But not where they are paid from. That doesn't say that the income has been produced over there. Uh, you can pay from another so uh, state than where the entrepreneurial activities take place. Uh, for instance, if you have a PE, then the state of residence of the company is also entitled then to tax. Well, that should not be the case, I think. And that's also a problem in Article 12b. However, and I'm not proud of our elections, and Joao is already smiling, but we have now, uh, to call it mildly, a right-wing government. Um, and to put it mildly, they seem not to be the most sympathetic government in respect to uh, developing countries. So what will happen? I don't know, but I hope that I stick to the 2020 policy and develop that further. But I'm very uh, reluctant to say that that will be done. That is more or less what I wanted to share with you, the Dutch historical overview. So we are paying increasingly attention, I would say, to the special needs of developing countries. Is there a European tax treaty policy? <laughs> the simple answer is no. <laughs> It's to the competence of each individual member state to develop its own tax treaty policy. Um, the exception to the rule is the uh, topic that has been discussed this morning already by Patricia and also by Na uh, Natalia, uh, the, the UN resolution on the promotion of inclusive and effective international tax cooperation at the United Nations. Yeah, that's quite a development, I would say. There you see... If you are, and this is my personal view, if you are neglecting as OECD the position of a lot of countries around the globe, especially also developing countries, at a certain time those countries will say, enough is enough. We don't think that we are represented sufficiently and that our needs and interests are taken into account sufficiently. I think that is the reason, maybe the main reason why we have now that initiative at the UN model. On the other hand, if I look at the developments now, the risk is, I think, and Patricia is very uh, positive on the developments, and I think Natalia also, I'm more reluctant because what you now see seems to be that developed countries and their interests 
may not be taken into account sufficiently in order to come to a consensus. And you may adopt the terms of reference by a large number of countries. But if at the end of the day, no tax treaties will be concluded between developing countries and developed countries, a lot of efforts will be produced like in the BEPS projects where we invested billions of hours of people, of money, in systems that may not fly like pillar one. Is that what we want? Or should we be more pragmatic and listen really to each other and take each other interests seriously? And not only your own interest, giving them the highest priority and forgetting the other ones. So where the OECD and the countries, the G7, G20, they do that, I think, in respect of developing countries, it seems to be that the roles are now upside down. So I'm more pessimistic. Well, certainly if you look at the position where the EU member states got together, and they are very, very uh, skeptical, to put it that mildly. Uh, they start, of course, being polite. Uh, there's a desire to promote efficient and effective process at the unit level in the area of international tax cooperation. Who can be against that? No one. I'm not. And to promote stability, certainty within the archi international architecture. But is that the architecture of the OECD countries, the capital exporting countries, or a new international architecture? The European Union is not clear on that. Uh, but then it starts to be a bit skeptical. Uh, the terms of reference of this framework are crucial, and then it should clarify and determine the future work, including the high-level commitments and procedural rules. There you already see, well, the way that the decision-making process is going on now, we do not like it. Should there be something different then? And there should also be clarity of that convention. Is that an international treaty, yes or no? Uh, it seems to be yes. And the importance of and here it comes again, consensus-based decision-making. We want to be heard and we want to be part of the decision-making process. So they are skeptical. Discussions uh, uh, on the associated work, so it should not copy or redo the work that has already been done by the OCD, the G7. Actually then you are saying, hey, we should stick to the system as it is, I think. Maybe not. And there are concerns regarding the simultaneous development of early product, uh, term protocols. And the EU makes suggestions to include domestic resource mobilization, capacity building, fostering tax compliance. Two minutes. My God. Well, I, I conveyed much of my messages. Um, but that implies that Digitalization of the economy is not on the agenda for the EU. Well, I will skip that one um, and briefly come to uh, the map that has been developed by uh, the competent authorities between the Netherlands and, and Brazil. And what is the problem? I said the classification. Is it interest or dividend? Well, if you look at the Brazilian laws, tax laws, accounting laws, civil laws, the income is income from shares on equity, not debt claims. The same is true for the Netherlands. So if you apply the uh, interpretation rules, then the domestic laws prevail of the applying state, in this case for the taxpayer and credit, that's the Netherlands, then it is a dividend. But even if you take the context, including the Brazilian law, it is also income from shares. So there cannot be, and I will uh, skip the rest, there cannot be a problem in this way. The map cannot be valid because you can only have a map if there are doubts or difficulties. There are no doubts. It is income from shares or at least other corporate rights and therefore I think that the map is invalid and should be ignored not only for the past than it was here before 2002 but also currently. Well we are litigating and the Court of Appeals must say 
a bit more. Um, just a few words, if you allow me. And I connect with Joao's approach, the interest. Where should it be allocated? Well, for me, the principle of origin is decisive for a legitimate claim for any income, so also for interest income. And what is the origin? Because what we hear, heard this morning, it should be fair, it should be equitable. But how to assess whether an allocation of tax jurisdiction is fair or equitable? I think you have to base it on principles. And here the principle of origin is for me leading. So where is the substantial income producing activity carried out? And I thought when the web started in 2015, yes, the OECD understands what I mean. That because I already advocate that since 2001 in my PhD. And what's the origin of income? Human beings, the intellectual element. And if you follow that, you can get rid of PEs, tangible assets, not relevant. You get service PEs if uh, people are working in that state. And that's also for interest. Who is producing the interest? Not the creditor. He's lying on the beach, huh? making a phone call to the bank. Hey, did they pay? Yeah, did they pay? Another bottle, please. But the entrepreneur paying the interest, he is originating the interest income, adding the value. So if we would allocate the interest income unrestrictively to the state where the entrepreneur carries out its activities with the same tax costs, as with respect to profits, you take out the incentive also to finance companies with debts instead of equity. And that will strengthen not only the enterprise, but also the economic infrastructure of that state. And I think especially developing countries which are dependent on uh, corporate income tax to a large extent, and if there will be no drain anymore on tax jurisdiction in respect of interest, that would be beneficial, much more beneficial than, I will stop within 15 seconds, uh, than introducing Article 12b, because then 12b is only looking at from which state is the royalty paid, not where the income is produced. And again, think of the comparison between intangible property and machinery. Economically, they are the same. They should also have the same treatment. This is briefly what I wanted to share with you. There are a lot of slides. I don't know whether they are made available uh, after the Congress. Well, yeah, you can have a look at it, and you can always contact me uh, in Tilburg. Thank you very much for your attention. Obrigada, Eric. Thank you, Eric. If we have time, then we can ha go to the Q&A because uh, you already had many other slides to share. But now, I think that what Eric has addressed is the uncertainty of the new government. But the previous government was much more focused on investments in developing countries. And there is also the importance of anti-abuse clauses, which Ramon will also elaborate more on. So he'll be speaking about this pro this prospect of the anti-abuse clauses. So, come on. Good afternoon, everyone. It's an honor to address to you at this Congress. I would like to thank Dr. Rodrigo Luis Fabio and Dr. Schroeder for the invitation. I'd like to greet my colleagues, panelists. And it's an honor to speak before Dr. Eric Cameron and Professor Elena Torres. He was my professor at the School of Law. And Dr. E Eric, I also would like to greet Julia, Priscilla, and Ricardo my colleagues at the panel. Well, my topic is about the anti-abuse uh, measures in the new, uh, agree, uh, new double taxation agreement signed by Brazil. 
Now, what was our policy with regard to the anti-abuse related to double taxation? So there was a preamble saying that it was related to fight uh, tax evasion. We also had the concept of effective beneficiary inspired in the clause that was addressed in the OECD uh, uh, framework that deals with the people between the source and the beneficiary of the income and these people that will not have the power to use uh, that uh, wealth in their own benefit and they should give this or grant this to a third party and as it would be the fiduciary. We also have the saving clause, the saving clause and the some treaties signed with Peru, Mexico, and South Africa. And basically they said that the provisions of uh, this agreement will not prevent these states to apply their own rules related to CFC and subcapitalization in their own countries. There were cl specific clauses related to anti-abuse in some treaty signed w with Mexico, Israel, Turkey, Venezuela, and Russia that authorized states to negate access uh, to other to other measures related to abuse and exchange of information, which is since 1998 had been developed as an alternative for the states in view of the fact that how could they benefit, uh, provide benefits and this will impact income. So this is why they had to fight against that tax evasion in a more effective way. So in a nutshell, this is what we had prior to PEPs. Now the new trends. We have a new preamble that now says the objective of this double taxation agreement is to avoid the double uh, taxation, of the, that is reduced or the absence of uh, taxation. Professor Baez uh, recently published an article questioning the effectiveness of this uh, preamble that I recommend it to re re is reading. There is a saving clause that is limited to, to transparent entities. So basically, this clause establishes that in the cases of uh, access uh, to conventional um, benefits by uh, entities will not uh, tax uh, their own entities. And this has to do uh, with the partnership report. And there's a minimum period of uh, 365 days for dividends, especially for tax rates that are reduced uh, related to dividends. This is a clause to avoid that those structures of selling shares with uh, a repurchase clause and also for the surrogate uh, belly, for example, and a period of 665 days uh, look back test. As you know, in the OECD uh, framework in Article 13, Paragraph 4, we, there is a clause saying that when you sell shares, with more than 50% of your assets located in the source state, the state can tax it. And what happened, there was a capitalization made with other assets in real estate in order to reduce this amount of 50% and then avoid this taxation. So he said that during 365 days prior to the selling, this clause applies to it. We have now the clause regarding the principal purpose test that was addressed current this morning by Professor Ander that basically allows states, contracting states, deny access to a conventional benefit if one of the main purposes of the transaction was to have access to a double taxation agreement unless the concession of this benefit is in accordance with the purpose of the clause. There's a lobbying clause simplified as in the treatment treaty of Singapore, which is basically a rule, mechanical rule to access conventional benefits. So we have we have benefits tests, partnership tests, uh, business active tests. There's a clause of discretionary relief, and we have the credit method. The Brazil is step by step replaces with the credit method and replaces the exemption clause because it makes difficult double taxation of income scenario. The first finding here, which is important for the final conclusion, we have an increase of mechanism available to states according double taxation agreements to, in order to avoid or treaty shopping. And the next step I would like to give is basically to look two cases, uh, 
captured by CAFI before the enforcement of these rules, so later we can check the impact of these rules for these cases. So the first case is a bevy that basically it had an investment in a partnership as co-located in Uruguay during 1999-2001. They alleged losses. And then in 2002, when uh, this company was a certain profits, the domicilization happened in December 2002 before the generated circumstance of the profits is according to several for article by 205 from December, a redomicile to Argentina where it has to an agreement of double taxation executed with Brazil to invoke the protection of by article 7. CAF understood that in this situation, it accepted the redomicilization of Uruguay, Argentina, and offsetting the losses, but said that double taxation agreement could only be enforced by outcomes that were generated in Argentina as of the change in December 22. Therefore, it created a mechanism of pro hata enforcement of double taxation agreement, although the dom according to domestic legislation generating factor, it of course happens in December 31. And this is mechanism that was adopted probably due to a lack of uh, anti abuse or anti-treaty shopping clause. Now, JTB is the second cause established a holding in Denmark and had an investment in other jurisdiction, Egypt, USA, and so this treaty, treaty has a compatibility clause that sets forth in the article in the wording at that time, non-distributed profits of an SA of a contracting state where the capital was controlled partially or totally by the resident of the state could not levy tax on this. So profits not apportioned could not be subject matter of taxation and the uh, tax administration a solution for Hosich 1803 recognized in such cases it would not be possible to enforce the taxation rule and JBS resorting to the street would not tax profits from these entities abroad and profits consolidation was made in the first level which was the Denmark entity and the solution provided by CARFI which is the administrative council of tax appeals the anti uh, a clause, clause anti-treaty shopping they could not rule on something so the decision on, of anti-treaty rule was only to deny the informers of any standard of double taxation agreement when one of them as Treaty shopping is not capable that the signatory of force unilaterally without being part of the treaty to disconsider the legal entity of a holding. And the decision sets forth an anti-treaty clause could not be enforced laterally. This is a measure that must be agreed uh, between the contracting parties or states. And before that, this initial finding that we have new tools available to the states to avoid anti-treaty shopping, the solution for such cases would be different if, by an example, we enforced clause of principal purpose test. And as I mentioned, this clause foresees a benefit can be denied if it's res reasonable to conclude that one of the purpose was the treaty benefit to be obtained. So up to here, probably both situations, we would say that one of the main objectives was to have the conventional benefit redomiciling redom from Uruguay to Argentina might have different reasons, but the treaty was a factor that probably performed a relevant role. And as for Denmark, the clause of incompatibility that uh, prevents taxation abroad might have had an important role in the choice of that jurisdiction. But then we go to the final part of the clause which sets forth unless it is shown that the granting of this benefit under the circumstance would be in accordance with the subject matter and purpose of the provisions of the convention. And then we go back to that debate that historically regarding treaty shopping that Professor Schwery wrote his thesis that was published in 95 on the tax planning for double taxation agreement. And we go back to the first situation whereupon states might have different points of view regarding treaty shopping and tolerance levels regarding the 
treaty shop. If we think the redomicilization with Argentina, under the eyes of Argentina, it became have a new legal entity headquartered in that jurisdiction that might provide uh, investments to that country. Now, as for Denmark, although investments are being channeled to different jurisdictions, there will be a portion of dividends and financial flow to that country. That might be something that the country might want to attract. Therefore, countries, naturally, they have different points of view regarding treaty shopping and regarding the level of link binding that an entity might have with the jurisdiction so it can claim the ben conventional benefits be claimed. And this scenario shows, according to my reading, that we have a trend of adopting more measures and rules that are more strict to avoid the treaty shopping. But we keep on in a situation that's different to make a difference. What are the legitimate transaction, bona fide trans transaction, and artificial transaction? Which rules benefit to from double taxation agreements, and which ones should be ev avoided? So we have treaties that would be applied that are do not meet the justifications that are subjacent to these clauses. And we have an issue regarding a low pro proving requirement. It was concluded that is a situation of anti-treaty shopping, that the clause might be enforced and the due legal process, and also incapacity of taxpayers previously to know if they will have access to the conventional benefits, something that using Professor Alberto's expression, it affects the cal norm uh, calculation. So these treaties are instruments celebrated by states in order to bring safety legally wise and the idea before behind it the treaties not as change as frequent like domestic legislations to last long years and men Patricia mentioned the first ones were celebrated by the end of 60 and effective to date so to have legal safety anti-treaty shopping clauses like this one does not contribute to this purpose therefore bef with this my suggestion would be that these enforcement of anti-treaty clauses, rules the, like PPP and the others would be the conclusion of both states. They have a consensus or have that abusive situation, therefore they do not deserve the protection of double taxation agreements because we are in a scenario with huge tech advance in cooperation among states. I believe this would be a possible solution and would not hinder state's supervision activity with reducing the margin of discretionality and more s s safety regarding the legal system and so forth. Now, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ramon. Now, after seeing a bit about the anti uh, the clauses of anti-shopping against antitrust. So I pass the floor to Professor Eleno Torres to talk a bit more th more about double taxation agreements according to Brazil's eyes. So good afternoon, attendees. I am very honored to come back to this Congress, the 10th Brazilian Congress of International Tax Law by IBDT. And I'd like to congratulate Professor Schwery, my peer in the department, my dear previous de head of department that I took his place, and Ricardo Maris de Oliveira on the governing body of the Institute for this fantastic meeting. And equally, here say that Priscilla and Julia here you all obviously a table that is very important regarding its content. I congratulate all on, on, be on your behalf. I would like to stress how I really enjoyed what you said and it removed the need of to talk about the monetary policy of agreements, especially tax planning. The first issue one poses is Brazil. Do we have a the national tax policy? 
Now, when in 95 I published, no, 96 I published a book regarding in, there were, uh, the international taxation on companies' income. It had an access of tax policy because back then we did not have a taxation or in Brazil a tax worldwide taxation just when 9403 9, and 9429 act was effe became effective we started having some rules regarding international taxation after these rules were accrued specific regime system controlled ab abroad transfer pricing came on the original and they were improved and then subcapitalization nevertheless Brazil's legislation was never concerned with confirming and the inland revenue less what is the international tax policy of Brazil for residents, non-residents abroad, treatment of import-export neutralities. So, and even, not even in the motivations of the administrative act, this is shown. Conversely, many times we translation with what Kozic states according to its understanding and what is shown in legislated tax motivation. So Brazil was never concerned with a tax policy that was international. And by the way, the group that acts on inland revenue, and by the way, an excellent group, and not that long ago, absolutely limited to one or two or three individuals that conducted all this. I did, as I said, heroically, the building of the pillars of this we know today as the, at least, a structure of international taxation in Brazil. but. This started to be changed as of 2018 onwards. I participated in different moments and debates regarding laws regarding international taxation issues and uh, drawn up an important part of the Repatriation Act for assets of O16, I was part of the ref reform of transfer pricing of O13, and these groups have always shown they were open for a consistent, productive dialogue. But it was precisely as of the moment that starts to think about the entering the o OCD, OECD. I'm sorry. In fact, we have there a debate where upon the Industry Natural Con National Conven Confederation and other players interacting with the inland revenue, with the dialogues with the OECD, then Brazil starts to be concerned in be more clear regarding the tax policy that would be international for Brazil. At this point, actually, I would say that Claudia Pimentel and others or the important auditors of the RF, they did a huge contribution, very positive for this advance. Nevertheless, I would say that this building started to lose strength when Brazil accepted to submit to some regime system. I don't want to take he over here position of politicization of the subject, but, but in some positions of alignment with a certain government that's specific abroad, and then afterwards this president leaves office, the Brazil lose full support with the OECD to f move forward with this purpose. And in fact, that currently I think that Brazil does not see more interest on resuming this dialogue. But there are several factors involved in this. The first being that Brazil was always aligned with UN, the this organization, which is the continuum of the Society of the Nations, always confirmed the principle 
of the source being the criteria for taxation. Therefore, I spent six years recently, 2016 up to no, or 15 to 21, participating the, in these activities of the social board and experts committee of UN and could notice that there, in fact, is the stage of those countries that are developing and have the preference for the taxation on the source. And ba uh, back then, the then Inland Revenue Secretary, George Rashid, obviously voted always in coherence with all the following countries, Latin American, African countries, east of Europe, that had an expectation to protect the source in detriment of residents. And the Brazil always tackled on this logic. So supporting and taking off position of OCDE and what's interest when the, the residency interest for the taxation of profits abroad, prices, transfer prices, and never for technical services. This because for technical service, what interests is the source. So much that Brazil does not admit to sign a double taxation agreement with the USA. It's so interesting on it that we do not admit going back to the table of treaty negotiation with Germany. This because, because the trade balance for technical services is absolutely unbalanced. We pay more royalties abroad than logically than we what we receive. So there's no balance here. And being this so, there's no interest in agreement. So an agreement to avoid double taxation goes beyond the source of income debate. And for this purpose, we have protocols. Recently, we signed on the STF, the highest cost, something that I would never think about it. So uh, from the old points of view, this because the Procuradoria da Fazenda Nacional know the protocols of so many years, so this is very recent, more than four or five years. We start a debate regarding we have to get the protocols with same efficiency of international conventions to avoid double taxation, and this debate goes to such a point that now the ST, Supreme Court consolidates case law where there are technical services with transfer technology. It is applied the system of royalty without technology, with protocol, so it's the same enforcement. It's insane at all costs, but this shows that the lack of a clear norm governing this point. The Brazilian reforms, they one by it's followed one by the other, and they, they comply were the second article of double taxation convention. Brazil should, each time it amends its legislation about subcapitalization, foreign profit, transfer pricing, regarding whatever it was, it should go back and sit in the, at the table with the countries and inform changes on its tax legislation. Informing, is this informed? No, it does not. So it does not do so. And why? Because there is uh, no international tax policy. It is necessary to discuss this in Brazil. Recently, I would like to highlight the Leo, Leo Daniel Laurie uh, work on here on a law that now is started a new process. So it gave origin to a new discussion. So in Brazil, to take a clear position with regard to all the income. So after all, so about funds abroad and etc. So what is the tax that should apply to this? So then we come to the regime. This is an example to be followed. And why this is not what well, this was not informed to the countries to whom Brazil has signed the treaty so that in their construction related to income of individuals, this should be applicable. We don't know. Silence is favorable because in silence you can just get the taxpayer in the next corner. You know, you can just find the, the taxpayer because he did not know how to um, enforce the treaty because of the construction that was given, that was totally transferred to the taxpayer because uh, the taxpayer understands uh, the treaty or interprets uh, the treaty 
and the agreement. So that the uh, tax authorities can think well, for five years whether that is really acceptable or not from its perspective, depending on interest, interest in tax collection. So this is a technique that they have used. So I would say to you, all of you, that today I don't see that Brazil is interested in, be, in being a member of o OECD, but it, it is there. And I would say honestly, if I were the president of the Republic, I would rethink this position because the cost the, in terms of budget to participate in the OECD is very high. If I have the same benefits as any other one who does, is not a member, why do I want to be a member of that to whom I have to pay a fortune to be a member? This is just for uh, wealthy people, wealthy countries, no. But anyway. I believe the OECD has a lot to contribute to Brazil. I have defended, continue to defend the fact that Brazil should be a member of OECD. But maybe now the world has gone through so many changes and hard changes that maybe Brazil can think better on this aspect. And tax reform on the income is still to come. It's starting next year. We're going to close the tax reform on income or consumption. I'm going dis to start discussing the tax reform on income, dividends, interest on non capital, and other issues related to technology. All of this will be discussed, and also tax on individuals' income. That will change a lot. So, not necessarily, this may involve a lot of dialogue with all the parties involved in these issues with uh, OECD. As to the double tra uh, taxation issues, I think this is where there is a lack of clarity on the tax policy and international, well, both international and Brazil is really very remarkable. Over all these years, Brazil has never showed to the taxpayer what it's understand by a permanent establishment. Never. So, does a taxpayer apply a permanent establishment because they fear? Because a permanent establishment, you know, as a shredder teaches here, Rodrigo and everyone teaches, they teach that this is not only material, this is not something that is fixed or something that, uh, that, that there is a that has a branch or there is an op a specific operation with people, machinery. It can be just a rep. It can be a person, just someone who works on behalf of a company. And they can also have a triangle transaction made among different countries. It can also hold different functions. And this taxpayer is not certain in terms of l the law that in order to apply this international treaty because the treaty is never applied I isolatedly you know in terms of a passively aspect they need a clause of 3.2 because the concepts that are not expressly set forth and also qualified in that text you know and perma a permanent establishment is there set forth all the ones have to be interpreted according to the national laws, but many times the tax itself about what permanent establishment is also refers back to the domestic law. So what do you do in this case? You know, the absence of having a fundamental concept that is important for you to solve conflicts about double, in or double international taxation, which is the permanent establishment. As to the royalties, well, Professor Br Brito Machado II is here. You know, you were not born at this time. I was not even born that. But there is, there is this law that dates back to the 1950s. So, you know, this when we had the, this is the time when we had the first of, uh, plants that manufactured vehicles established in Brazil. <coughs> And this law is still the reference about the royalty taxation. And the world has only technology. So what is tax policy that you can see there? We should have predictability and uh, to give to our taxpayer. The, tax, the taxpayer here in Brazil 
<laughs> is the resident or non resident? Everyone who wants to operate in Brazil has to know what is the law that applies to double taxation and foreign or non foreign. So, this is one of the major tasks that the Brazilian tax administration has to deliver to the Brazilian taxpayer in its tax uh, uh, income tax uh, reform. Credit. Taxpayers have to state their income, whether they were charged or not, and they can only make up the credits in Brazil or two or three years later. It doesn't happen like that in any other country. Credit has to be recognized in the year of that uh, sta statement. <coughs> Exchange of information. In the opinions that I have seen about the ex information exchange, I just found a fish ex expedition. So you ask information to the funds abroad to get those, the people that are participating in that fund, in such a way, send me the information against uh, Article 5 that expressly states that you can only request information when there is a de is determined subject. And fish expedition is not allowed. This is for forbidden. And why do you do that? Because there is a lack of legislation stating how to use this uh, treaty on exchange of information. They created one, but they forgot to regulate that domestically, establishing how you apply this multilateral treaty about the exchange of information. An amicable procedure. We have a legislation about tax transactions that is moving on every day. We have discussions about uh, tax arbitration and many other mechanisms to, sh to solve all these uh, disputes related to international treaty. And we also have room for this amicable solution with the IRS. But the question is, after all, all these procedures, amicable procedures, agree with what OECD has debated recently. I don't believe so. And there is another issue that is uh, key and urgent, and that has to do with legal certainty on the application of international agreements, ha shows clearly that the IRS interprets agreements is in a static or dynamic way. When the static interpretation is favorable to them, so they refer back to some to the date when that agreement was signed, and then when it's not interest, so they just uh, resort to the last version of the OECD comments, for example. And especially when there are measures about anti-abuse or treaty shopping. So they say, oh, this is the last version, and this is the one that will apply. But in practice, you know, when there is not favorable to them, so the interpretation is static, verbatim, and with no change in time. So all of this seems to be incoherent. When we speak about uh, international tax policy for Brazil, I also think that we have the duty to clearly express our opinion to show when the verbatim interpretation should apply and also static interpretation. And obviously, when we can resort to the comments that was recently said and expressly on based on the reasons of uh, transfer pricing. And they agree with that because then the taxpayer knows that they can resort to that instrument. And I'm also going to interpret that article based on that reason. So you can see this is no criticism to IRS, Ricardo, in meaning to say that uh, there is only failure. No, this is just to show that this is only harms uh, the, tax, uh, the Brazilian tax authorities and that because it creates difficulties so that investors had uh, have a certainty on what is applicable here in Brazil, and it also harms all of us when we need to expend hours and hours the discussing uselessly when all of this could be solved with a good and adequate legislation covering all these aspects. Thank you. Enjoy this Congress.
Thank you. And now I pass the floor to Ricardo. Now he has the hard task of uh, bringing the another side of this discussion. And he is being, he's been leading several negotiations. And I think that he can bring his perspective on a tax policy that we have uh, said. Because Dr. Eleno just brought one, of the one side of this. And maybe now we can hear from the IRS how they see this. Well, I'm not really leading it. I participate in negotiations, right? But I do not define the agenda. Well, I enjoyed your presentation, uh, Elena, don't worry. I'm going to give you an overview of the treaties, and then I'll try just to make some comments uh, interspersed. I'm going to give you this overview and how I interpret all the treaties, the values involved in them, and how these uh, were mirrored in the policies. And then I'm going to make a comparison with what we have today. Now, as uh, Silvetti uh, uh, said in the morning, there are inter there's international regime. And this word regime derives uh, from a total branch uh, of studies and international relations called the theory of regimes. Very few people know it but it was designed in the 1970s and was developed by using microeconomics insights. There, are, there is analysis of the states uh, that, and how they're concerned about the power, the interests, or absolute gains or relative gains. In certain moments, States also are concerned with, all, with what other states are doing and the values that change according to the conviction that they have and how my policy can affect another partner. And this is what we have uh, heard from Professor Eric. So and uh, how this evolved, and he also mentioned the word considerate. trying to find a word in Portuguese, which is more difficult, you know, by taking into account the interests of the other developing countries and progressively being more flexible to the point that recently the Netherlands uh, accepted to the renegotiate treaties based on this. So they have limited uh, the prospects of maximizing this and took into account the interests of other countries. So all these elements will be addressed during my talk, and towards the end, I'm going to speak about the changes that we have implemented over time, uh, especially with regard to these treaties. I think that the, the print is not that big, but I interpret that the international, tax, international taxation is a, is a set of treaties, and is governed by some principles and these principles are uh, de facto conditions or also rightfulness. So for example, today, there is no, it's not accepted to certain things and causality. So different taxes are applied by different countries with a very, very big difference in tax rates that usually encourages the tax planning and convictions or de facto con convictions that develop developing countries are more susceptible to damages related to uh, tax planning. And how the international tax regime has evolved. In the first phase, I usually say that it covers from 1920s to 60s. That was more focused on liberalization. There was a confusion between liberalization of trade and how this was comparable to liberalization of income treaties. And this confusion, there was a confusion thinking that they would produce the same result, but it's not so. Because assets, income, liberalization, because it's more moving, can also erode the, uh, the tax base. And the second phase between the 1960s and 97, 
they started to realize that liberalization promoted by treaties created dysfunctional effects. So there were discussions about uh, tax havens and treaty shopping. And this is when some uh, treaty shopping uh, rules started to be implemented, especially in the United States, who is a hegemonic uh, player. And usually we just uh, emulate what the US usually do. The, do. Uh. In that period, This is when we had the first reports being uh, published. And we, re we see that the states uh, saw that the benefits should be sent to the pay taxpayers by credit. There were exemptions and so on. And then which is rich, uh, shopping would be acceptable. It started in 1998, we started to believe that, uh, or there were some, uh, some ideas that causality, whatever was right, was something to be done. So some reports were published in order to fight against uh, treaty shopping and so on. And this started to be seen the initiatives. And then it was very difficult for Brazil to negotiate tax sparing report or tax sparing because of the reports that were prepared by the OECD in the end of the 1990s. In 2009, there was a change of value and, inter and interests. With the financial crisis, we started to have a new stage in international relations, especially in terms of a taxation regime, and the focus was on the exchange of information. Then in 2013, we have BAPS with some principles of transparency and so on, which increase uh, taxation at the residence, a uh, place of residence, and also uh, rules of supercapitalization and also rules against hybrid instruments, for example. And now I would say that starting with BAPS 2.0, we have more conviction that uh, treaties do not limit the source uh, taxation through this augmented CFC, which is the uh, income rule. But on the other hand, the source country is, is started to realize that if you're taxing there, we cannot give you more exemption. We cannot match, have a matching credit. So we want to recover that, tax, that taxation at the source. So other countries started to claim ma for mechanisms in order to recover that taxation at the source. And this led to the creation of STTR, which was not mentioned so far, and DMQ, MDD, or DMTT. There are several other acronyms. So this is a way to neutralize or increase uh, taxation at the source, and also amendments made uh, to capital gain. So I mean that there was a change over time, so shifting from the idea of having and tax at the hands of the taxpayer, and then they realized that this caused too many problems, and then we started to migrate to the credit method. And more recently, apart from that, the, the countries at the source and said that if now that you are going to tax there at the place of residence, within the scope of residence, so I also want to recover this taxation that makes no sense or not to levy tax at the source. And with this, we had many initiatives. The last one, I would say, is within the UN scope, the attempt to place as one of the early protocols services taxation. So I understand that it's part of this context. Now, going towards the more specific side of things, I would say that on an overall, the practice of treaties, once we don't have the policy for Brazilian treaties, I would say there's a huge influence by UN model or several of the practice we adopted were previous to models of UN, even before, if I'm not mistaken, one part that's quite peculiar regarding our practice is protocol in Brazil we explored as a part of the text under the eye of uh, Vienna's convention is instrument made in the same instance of the convention it might have specific rules, exceptions, construe rules, shedding lines, explanations. I was uh, not long ago on and negotiating an agreement. We reached a 
the tw 20th item regarding domestic, how to construe elements. And within the protocol we've reached this moment, in perhaps the last day of this convention, we in the past paced, place technical services and technical assistance taxation, not mentioning the requirements of technology transfer. Therefore, the last point is regarding the involvement of our practice of the policy of the treaties reflect these beliefs as causality, what's right to do, what works out, arising from the international community of studies. So we are in line with what is happening. It does not to be equal, but it follows the line. Now, changes that we have adopted. First, our it's mandatory, it's a political commitment. We place all the minimum standards of PEPs on the treaties as of 016, 017, and good part of all that was possible to negotiate regarding the recommendations. S minimum standards are dealing with the preamble, the foreword of the title of convention that avoids tax evasion, and also at least TBT or LOB detailed with uh, not LOB and PTT, LOB simplified, which is limitation of benefits, or an update the article regarding amicable procedures. These were the minimum standards, and additionally, we have adopted saving clauses. I think all renegotiations we have this clause, saving clauses. It's good. I like to talk less because of the prerogative of the excise. I like the joke, and therefore, saving clause, I understand it's not applicable to our, at least this was not the intention, it's not applicable only to um, transparent entities, which is uh, something Hamon does not agree. We updated the B, the B agent, we can don't have to negotiate the agreement, it might just have a, a main role in the conducting the contract. Here is a point uh, that it talks with Professor Eric's presentation. All Brazilian treaties, they refer to the qualification of domestic act with additional items, both interest as dividends. We don't follow the standard of UN, UN. It has excluded the residual domestic treatment. Therefore, we negotiated that amicable procedure basically with RTO. And we understand that that would be not exactly the best, qual best qualification for JDP, uh, the article of interest because Article 10 refers also to the qualification of the domestic, domestic law uh, on tax but not partnership. In our domestic tax law um, at the source, GCP is not interest. Uh, we don't know if it's a we debatable if it's a corporate right. And uh, now as for interest, the qualification, we have the reference for the domestic law for uh, the types of instruments. And and we did not place Article 12A in all agreements, but we understand the coverage is identical to what we have already at the protocols. This because some countries just rather not have 12A or from UN because fees for technical services, because some countries would rather not have it. Netherlands. They don't want like to put 12A on their treaties, so they kept the technical services taxation on the protocols as we have. And I have to move forward now. Uh, and offshore articles, capital gain is quite peculiar regarding our convention. We have a wide taxation withheld at the source that is well indirect capital goods taxation and this is allowed also now the final part five minutes 
Well, according to our negoci negotiation, we reflect on more recent negotiations, especially after 017. We, uh, we, uh, we, we use PPT with LOB, just not PPP alone, because it does not work. The practice of those countries, even in Europe, is scarce. There's lots of resistance, difficulty to enforce PPT, and therefore we'd rather conciliate and complement with LOB. Now and then we change the text of LOB, uh, so it varies from agreement to agreement. Point two regarding the idea that uh, reflecting the I recent idea that treaties should not be used for granting benefits for countries and benefit treaty shopping and so forth, we do as a rule of thumb, it's 20 years we do this. We have a reference regarding the protocol that treaties do not limit the enforcement of the SA clause that avoid uh, the treaty shopping, the wording that's the second, uh, the, the prevalence rule of the domestic anti treaty legislation. Some countries don't need this. The, they can, uh, the name is SARS, specific anti avoidance rules. There are specific rules anti treaty shopping, they would oppose to a specific trade. A country like the USA would be easier, but some countries with some different tradition, it would be different, difficult. So to avoid this sort of debate, we just place this generic reference. So it varies the text of this provision. Some countries, they asked if we were to number, list the anti-treaty shopping with the non-list, perhaps we will do in one way uh, it's under negotiation and I find this is a good idea. The next point I always like to address is the one regarding comments to Article 1 deal very well and it's more than 10 years, probably 20 years, the relation between the anti uh, treaty shopping and treaties, its relation. So general rules can be domestic or set forth by the treatment. The general GAR, the GAR rule foreseen by the treatment is PPT, but there are variations on the PPT that come from BEPS. The anti-GAR domestic legislation might be legislative. This is quite clear in the comments, or it might be uh, arising from case law and uh, sentences. Most of the countries, it is a case law rule. It started in USA, then France. Several countries, sometimes it might even end by be regulated later. But frequently arising from the GAR, it's a rule of jurisprudence or case law. And the comments reflect the idea we can uh, address uh, debate if it's valid or not, the anti gar uh, both for treaties and basically for domestic act might prevail when compared to the treatment. So another way not much used in Brazil to avoid the sho treat shopping, treaty shopping is finding where's the tax residents of the corporation basically identify the effective administration site and we have to address what the concept and for the penal code there are some elements regarding legal safety and or even using the concept of permanent established to avoid abusive concept and another point or subject for the treaty sorry, dealt in these comments against the shop, treaty shopping. It's the concept or idea that this, the treaty shopping could be dealt as the domestic law and the construe when we have a tax obligation, it would be a subject of the domestic law and not the treaty subject. So now, I would like just the final remarks regarding 25. We updated the MAP procedure. I co agree with Eleno. I think it, there are things to improve at the map, but frequently taxpayers, they file a request that not fulfill the requirements. Out of the deadline, requests regarding by which there's a 
legal decision as sentenced by the court, all this violates standards. Not always the taxpayers know about the standards that are in the OECD documents. Now we started including Article 9293 of UN because not because it's necessary, but it will provide some incentive for companies improving the view of the country. And we also excluded the exemption method because it became uh, the paid CFC where dividends were exempt, where it would be paid, and so forth. The income. And finally, as of 2019, when I returned from Vienna, we started to stop uh, clauses of more favorable nation, few clauses in this sense, because I started to advocate the idea that it was not worth to renegotiate treaty at the expense of placing lots of clauses of more favorable na nations, and so it was not sustainable. So changing a treaty would have a domino effect in all our network and the cost that would be too high. So basically, and recently we excluded, if you have noticed, there are some negotiations that uh, they s terminated at this moment, but I was not part of these negotiations. My time is due, and that's it. My time is over. <laughs> Thank you, Ricardo. In fact, time is not our friend here. But finally, I do believe we have explained most of the practice. As you mentioned, the practice by the excise, I think it was an excellent panel and shed light on things. And we leave the premises with lots of doubts. We have received several questions and the next panel, the opportunity to shed light on these doubts and Eric interest in special in hearing the answers and contribute with his thought regarding it. And I thank again the opportunity, especially by IBDT, to put me in this table of this level of knowledge and I being the mediator of this debate that was so rich and I thank you all. Now we have the Q&A panel, thank you.